Well, hello there, everybody. This is Snackbox coming to you to talk to you a little bit about segment eight of the Colorado Trail. Can you hear that I'm excited about this? You should because I am super amped. If you have made it this far, this is when all of your effort starts to pay off. You start to get those huge, huge, huge views. You start to really understand how to do this through hiking. I am amped for you if you've made it this far. Appreciate you sticking around with me here. We've got a lot to do, so I'm going to take a sip out of my new outdoor comfort zone coffee mug here. Little picture of the Ray Lakes area in Kings Canyon, California. If you're watching this on the date of the release, pay close attention because those permits are up starting on February 9th, 2021. Kings Canyon just instituted a new permit system. It's about 43 to 46 miles, depending on who you ask. It is a great first multi-day backpacking trip for those of you new to the sport. But for right now, we've got to talk about segment eight of the Colorado Trail. Let's get to it. That's sweet. All right, so first thing about the segment eight of the Colorado Trail is that it's going to go from the Copper Mountain Resort all the way to the Tennessee Pass, which lines you up for a day trip into Leadville, Colorado. Those two points are going to be really critical to all of the advice that I'm going to give you here, all the little pro tips that I have for you about segment eight. Let's talk first about the specs on segment eight because it's a really interesting one. If you remember from segment seven, I told you to pay attention to the elevation charts at the bottom of your data book and to start to try to figure out exactly how mileage affects how those appear on the page. Now, segment eight is quite a bit different than segment seven. Segment seven, if you remember here, was 13.2 miles long. It was about 3,700 feet of elevation gain and about 3,000 feet of descent. That's a really critical number to what I'm about to tell you about segment eight because segment eight, by comparison, is 25.4 miles long and it has an elevation gain of 4,400 feet and a descent of 3,800 feet. That's significant in a couple of ways. Number one is it means it's only about 800 feet of descent more, even though it has nine miles more in this segment. Also in, in terms of climbing, which many of you are probably most concerned about the climbing, the climbing is actually only about 900 feet more of climbing, despite the fact that it is nine more miles. What that means for you is that when you look at that chart, compare that chart at the bottom of segment eight in the data book to segment seven, and what you're gonna realize is that they can look very similar, but the actual hiking is going to be quite a bit different. That's good news because this segment is challenging. It's not nearly the same kind of challenge that you just experienced in segment seven. So that's great news for you in terms of this climb. You're gonna start this segment at Copper Mountain. What's more likely to happen is you're going to pass Copper Mountain on your way because there's not really a lot of great camping in that Copper Mountain Valley. So you're gonna have to either stop before that and, and pass Copper Mountain early in the morning, or you're gonna pass Copper Mountain and hike a few more miles until you can get into the segment far enough to actually set up a tent and camp. What that means though is if you are passing it in the morning, my first recommendation is that you stop in the Copper Mountain Resort and you pick up some type of dinner. Maybe you want a sandwich, maybe you want something from, you wanna go get a pizza and then take in some pizza to the campsite. As long as it doesn't have something like mayonnaise that can spoil, you're good. Just take it in and have it like you're having leftovers. It's a really great way to go because it's going to be extra easy for that night, which is always a bonus, right? Always a bonus. One of the things that makes segment eight most interesting is that this is the first time you will be above tree line for a protracted window of time. So from about mile 8.7 in to about 13 and a half miles in, so that just under five mile stretch, you'll be above tree line. So you might remember from the Georgia Pass segment, I believe it was segment six, I mentioned that that's a good opportunity to practice getting over those high elevation areas before the storm settle in. This is where that pays off quite a bit. Depending on where you are in your day, you can either stop just before Searle Pass or just after Kokomo Pass, because what will happen in this trip is you're gonna hike up, you're gonna get to Searle Pass, by the way, Searle Pass, maybe Surly Pass, I don't know. Searle Pass is one of the most beautifully breathtaking areas of the entire trip. I'll try to put up a couple of clips of what we saw from there in my hike, and it is just incredible. So highly recommend taking a little bit of time and enjoying that. But depending on where you pass, then you're going to stay above tree line as it wraps around this mountain and climbs gently over to the Kokomo Pass, and then it will descend quickly into the valley. My second recommendation is, depending on where you are in the day, plan to camp at tree line, either just before you leave tree line or when you return to tree line. 
either one of those will do. These are beautiful areas and it's a great opportunity to kind of slow up that pace and enjoy it a little bit. Which brings me to my final tip. This one's probably pretty obvious because it's a 25 mile stretch. This is where all of your hard work starts to pay off in big views. There's no reason to rush it. Really try to take your time and enjoy it. Take some great photos. I sure did. I've got some of my favorite photos from the trip. You can find some of these photos as well on my Instagram page, which is at Backcountry Champion on Instagram. I hope you'll find me there. Take a peek at that one. Take a peek at that one. And then lastly, this is a stretch where you will also hit a valley. And in the valley, sometimes you're going to find sheep in that valley. Herds of sheep, millions of sheep, maybe not millions, but you get the idea. A lot of sheep. If you encounter sheep, I recommend giving them a very wide berth. Try to give them 100 yards or so and keep an eye out for the Great Pyrenees that sometimes guard these flocks. They won't hurt you as long as you're not a threat. So just make sure that you're staying clear. I will tell you that later in the trail, when I was hiking it, I did encounter a set of three Great Pyrenees and they were none too happy to meet me. I might've had to change my pants after that experience. It was, it was kind of scary until I realized that they weren't trying to hurt me. They were just protecting the flock. So not something you need to be super afraid of. The sheep are often in the way. They're not going to hurt you, obviously, but just keep an eye out so that you don't appear to pose a threat to the sheep, especially if they're being guarded by some great Pyrenees, which are big dogs like my girls, but they are a whole different creature. So that basically covers it with segment eight. If you're not stopping in Leadville at this point at Tennessee Pass, you need to make sure you have everything covered for bug protection. The next two segments head into the Holy Cross Wilderness, and I believe it's the Mount Massive Wilderness from there. And those two segments are buggy, 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 buggy. If you don't have something to keep bugs off of you, if you don't like using DEET, totally understand it. Make sure you've got something. There are some natural alternatives as well. You can also dress for it so you can have some lighter clothes that are bug resistant, whatever it takes. If you get to Tennessee Pass and you don't have a way to keep bugs off yourself, you need to make a trip into Leadville and figure that out before you start this, or you're going to be pretty miserable for the next two segments. And they can be pretty beautiful. That covers it for here. I hope that you'll click like and subscribe and even hit that notification bell. Those are really helpful to us as we try to build this community below. Tell me your favorite place to go camping ever. I would love to hear it. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your favorite places in Colorado, not Colorado. I'd love to know it because I'm planning out my summer trip and I would like to know places that I can go backpacking when I'm finished with my Colorado trail through hike this July. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Knackbox here. If you want your sweet outside comfort zone mug, it even has a little logo here. Check this out. Doggy. That's a pretty nice one, right? It says outside is my comfort zone. That's really our goal here is to make everybody comfortable in the outdoors, especially you newcomers out there. Had a great time meeting a lot of you. And some of you, some of you veterans out there have been really helpful in the comments, making sure everybody understands all the different options they have for backpacking. So appreciate you all. I will talk to you soon. This is Snackbox out and I will see you all next time when we talk about segment nine, heading into the Holy Cross wilderness. Holy is it beautiful. Now the wind's blowing. Arr! Making me crazy today. Making me crazy.